bad news is, many of us are going to get either cancer or Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> the good news is, we're probably not going to get both. <laughs> I'm a biologist at the Whitehead Institute in Cambridge, Mass. And I'm in a really fortunate position. I get to run my own research lab. It's a little bit like uh, doing a, a nonprofit startup company, um, but probably far few head fewer headaches. Um, so what, we're get, what we get to do in my lab is we get to explore our big scientific questions. And the main one that we have that we're really focused on is trying to connect diseases like cancer and Alzheimer's disease that seem to have very little in common at first glance, but try to understand that at the fundamental level what's going on in these diseases. Okay, so what's the problem? Well, by the year 2050, cancer is going to account for as many as 17 million deaths per year, and it's gonna cost the world economy nearly $2 trillion to treat. And on the other hand, Alzheimer's disease and diseases like Alzheimer's are going to affect more than 115 million people and also cost the world economy over a billion dollars. So by 2050, these two diseases are going to be the cause of death for nearly one out of three people and one out of every $30 generated in the world is gonna to go to treat these diseases. So it's a really big problem, especially as our population ages. So like I said, we tend to think of these two diseases as really being opposite. And we think of this in a disease spectrum. So on the one hand, we have cancer. And cancer is, is as we all know, when cells grow and grow and grow and grow. And so we think of it as a disease of unchecked cell growth. Cells grow when they're not supposed to. And on the other hand, we have diseases like Alzheimer's, which have the opposite problem. Cells in the brain are dying, and they're dying prematurely. So one is a disease of not enough cell growth, and one is a disease of too much cell growth. So they seem very different. But there's actually something that links these diseases. And we know this because if we look at the population, we've seen a trend. Like I alluded to in, at the beginning, people who get Alzheimer's disease have a much lower risk than the average person of getting cancer. And people who get cancer, even if they get cancer as a child, much later in life, they have a much lower risk than the average person of getting a disease like Alzheimer's. And it's not just Alzheimer's. The same is true for Parkinson's and for ALS and for other diseases of this, of this nature. So there's something connecting these two diseases. And what I'm gonna argue for the rest of the talk today is that this has to do with protein folding. So what is protein folding? So, I think we're all on the same page that we've all heard of genes. And genes are parts of DNA. So there's a sequence of DNA, um, and that sequence is a gene. And what that gene does at a basic level is it codes for a protein. So I've drawn here this string of balls, different colors, and those represent the individual amino acids. And each protein is a string of amino acids. But these proteins, they don't do anything in the cell when they're just a string of amino acids they have to fold up into a very particular three-dimensional shape. And it's only when they've attained this shape that they're functional. So protein folding is this absolutely vital process going from a string of amino acids into a functional protein. Okay, so um, this is great. Proteins fold up and they do their thing. The problem is, though, that proteins don't always fold properly. Many times they'll fold up spontaneously, and some proteins are very good at this. But many proteins have a tendency to misfold. And misfolded proteins can be very toxic for the cell because they are prone to aggregation. And protein aggregates are very toxic. So many of us have heard of diseases like Alzheimer's, and one of the things we know is that they're characterized by plaques in the brain. And what these plaques are are actually aggregated, tangled up, misfolded proteins. And it's not just in Alzheimer's disease, but in uh, ALS, in Huntington's, in mad cow disease, and in Parkinson's disease. All of these neurodegenerative diseases have aggregated misfolded proteins as a hallmark. So, you know, if the cell is just getting aggregated proteins all the time, why aren't they just dying all the time? Well, it turns out that cells have a way of coping with aggregated proteins. And that's through things that we call chaperones. And this is actually a technical term, a term of art that we use to describe uh, agents in the cell that help to keep proteins from misfolding and prevent aggregates. So just like the chaperones that were at your high school dance, <laughs> these cellular chaperones prevent aggregation. <laughs> so they're vital to the cell. So why then, if cells have these chaperones, why do we ever get aggregated misfolded proteins, and why do we ever get disease? Well, 
There's a different metaphor that I like to think when I think of chaperones, which is that they're the cell's origami artists. They're in there to make sure that proteins don't misfold, and but more than that, that they're folded exquisitely into their absolutely perfect shape so that they can carry out their essential function. So these chaperones are absolutely vital. Bacteria cells have them, human cells have them. They're very ancient. So why then do cells ever have problems? Well, it turns out that the level of chaperones drops as we age, and in particular, they drop in the brain. So in a young, healthy brain, there are plenty of origami artists, all the proteins are perfectly folded, but as we age, the levels of chaperones drop, the misfolded proteins can accumulate, and then this can lead to aggregation. This leads us to a very simple idea, which is that diseases like Alzheimer's disease actually occur in brains when chaperone levels have dropped. So if that's the case, then there's a very simple solution, which is that if we could just increase the chaperone levels in the brain, then we could have a treatment for these diseases and perhaps even reverse them. So there's some hope about, about these neurodegenerative diseases. But I also promised I was gonna talk about cancer. So how do chaperones have anything to do with cancer? So at a basic level, cancer occurs when a single cell goes rogue. And that means it acquires a mutation that escapes the normal control that's kept, that keeps the cells in check. And then instead of, of functioning as part of the whole body, it decides it's gonna just grow and grow and grow, take the resources away from the rest of the body. And this is how tumors form. So at a fundamental level, cancer is caused by mutations. So how do mutations affect protein folding? Well, these mutations occur in genes, and many of these genes, like I said before, code for proteins. So if you have a mutation in a gene, that leads to a mutation in a protein. And mutations in proteins can make proteins more difficult to fold. So it turns out that many of the most uh, cancer-causing mutations actually do cause proteins to be become much less stable and rely much more heavily on chaperones. So why then don't the cancer cells self-destruct if they have these mutations? Well, cancer has figured out how to hijack chaperones. So cancer cells have figured out how to take the level of chaperones and artificially raise them in order to buffer against the misfolding effects that might be caused by the mutations. So cancer cells rely very heavily on these elevated levels of chaperones. So again, we have a very simple idea, which is that cancer cells require chaperones in order to, to, be, to survive. So if we could somehow decrease the level of chaperones in cancer cells, then we can unmask these mutations and their proteins could, could aggregate and we could have a way of cancer self-destructing. It could really be an Achilles heel for cancer. Cancer and Alzheimer's disease actually have something fundamentally in common at their root and that is an opposite requirement for chaperones. So in diseases like Alzheimer's, chaperone levels drop, misfolded proteins accumulate and aggregate, and that leads to cell death. Whereas in cancer, cancer has mutations that it needs to buffer against, so it figures out how to raise the chaperone levels. Okay, so what do we do here? Well, it leaves us with a simple solution, but it's actually kind of a catch-22. We like to think of this as a whack-a-mole problem. <laughs> you can imagine if we tried to knock down the level of chaperones to try to treat cancer cells, we can drop them down and sure, maybe we'll unmask the cancer cells and the cancer cells will self-destruct, but at the same time, we can drop the level so low that in the brain they drop and then we get misfolded proteins and get neurodegenerative diseases. So rather than taking this sledgehammer approach, what we really need is a Goldilocks approach. We need the pores not to be too hot or too cold, but to be just right. And what that means is we need to figure out how to fine tune chaperone levels. And we need to do this in a targeted way to target to the cell types that really need them. So in thinking about this, it's, it's really, we really think this is an Achilles heel for all cancers. All cancers rely on mutations. All cancers have increased levels of misfolded proteins. And all cancers seem to rely on chaperones. Of course, there's exceptions to any rule, but all subtypes of cancers are going to have something that can be treated this way. So we really think if we could figure out how to target chaperone levels in cancers, it wouldn't just be a cure for breast cancer or pancreatic cancer, but it could potentially be beneficial for all different types of cancer. And on the other hand, if we think about diseases like Alzheimer's, where we have not enough chaperones, if we could increase the level of chaperones, and specifically in the brain, and specifically as we age, then we really think we could have a treatment not just for Alzheimer's disease, but for Parkinson's, for ALS, for Huntington's, et cetera. So, we really hope that we're, we found a fundamental process that's related to both of these different types of diseases. So what we're studying in my lab is just how, to, how do we do this? How do we fine tune these chaperone levels? 
We figured out already how we can slam down on them or, or increase them way too much, but the fine-tuning mechanisms is not trivial, and that's what we're working on. So the hope is that with enough information, if we can figure out how to do this in a fine-tuned and targeted way, that we can dial the appropriate level of chaperones for an individual person in an individual case. And we can dial it to ALS or dial it down a little bit if there's a bit of cancer and hope to get this in the right place so that rather than getting either cancer or Alzheimer's disease, we get neither of these diseases. Thank you very much.